Alrighty guys, I am back for part three, um, which is probably the final part. And that will be adding these nice trees over the top of these pictures. Uh, <laughs> these pictures, oh my goodness. Hard to paint and talk at the same time. Uh, over the scene that I have here. Uh, so for this part, I'd like to introduce you to Perillion Green, um, which is uh, a new color to me, introduced by Molly Hashimoto, who I keep talking about. Um, but also very important in the Northwest. And if you don't live in the Northwest, um, you may not need this color, but it is the color of evergreen trees. And it's just, it's hard to achieve a dark green that works because usually when you're doing green, you're adding like a blue to it. You know, you can add different blues, like a Prussian blue or an indigo blue, a really dark blue. In fact, an indigo blue actually might make like a Perilian green, but it's just very handy to have that color in your palette when you live where I do and want to paint what I paint. Uh, because sometimes when you add a blue to, to your green, you're, you're darkening the value of the green, but you're also really showing the blue, which can work well. You know, you can make a, um, you can mix phthalo blue and yellow to make lovely colors that appear, oops, excuse me, that appear in Hawaii. But these are not the colors of the Northwest. Um, yeah, especially the blue. Uh, so anyway, so, so Perlian Green is just a nice way to achieve that. Licorice, be quiet, please. To achieve that without having to work so hard. I apologize, I'm just gonna ignore him because I don't have time to do this video again because I have to get to work one of these days. So, so here's my Perlian green and you can see now, I don't know if you could see that in the video, how it just resisted right there. That means that I probably had lotion on my hands and I touched the edge of my paper there. Um, which is one of the reasons I do not use the full paper as my edge. I, I, I draw a block and I know my students haven't learned to do this yet, but I highly recommend you get in the habit of this because once you've drawn this edge, you can start to think more about how your scene approaches your edges. And these edges are really important. You know, you'll look at different watercolorists or um, when you go to museums and see masterpieces, you can see how their brushstrokes and their colors approach their edges because that's just a really important part of the frame. And when we're using the full paper, I don't know, even for me now, I still, the edge of the paper doesn't work for me. I don't know. I, I need the reminder, I guess. Um, so anyway, here's my Perlian Green. And um, it's just a nice, dark, earthy green color. But here's the thing. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna go rogue again in this video, um, meaning rogue from my photo reference. Now, I, I, this is really important to remember, you guys. You are not painting this photo, okay? This is a photo reference. That's why we call it that because it is giving you the ideas for the shapes and, but it is not. We are not replicating this photo. We can't. Um, first of all, as I discussed in the first video, the photo wasn't even taken in a way that is. It, the best for uh, composition and uh, for art. So even in that sense, I would like to not follow the video and I already haven't. You can see my mountains higher and I have more of the rule of thirds going on as compared to this photo. But further, the light in this photo is not very interesting. Now that's okay for the photo because the person who took it was on their vacation or you know having the weekend at Rainier they were enjoying being in the national park uh you know they only have so many days so they have to work with the weather the weather that they work with but for my painting of Rainier I want a different kind of day now because of that right now because of the the lack of light from the cloud cover right now the trees are very, they look very black well I know from being in places like this that they are not black 
they are um, perlene green and they actually even have some light like this here would have some light coming through from the sky if it were not this kind of day and a photo probably you could see that if you were there in person sketching in person which is why um, i want to be spending more time doing that in my next years um, but from the photo, we can't tell. The, the camera just couldn't capture that. So I'm gonna create it because I've been in these places often enough to know that that's what would happen. I would see a lot more of the green up here um, if I were there in person and the light were coming through. So I'm gonna keep that in mind as I'm going in to paint my, my trees here. Um, I have a color here that I'm not sure what it is, but I think it's perylene green. Excellent. So. We're just gonna make kind of, a, there's also another blue here in my palette and that's okay. I'm just gonna add that. It's probably this phthalo blue green shade, which is a lovely color, but Molly Hashimoto introduced me to phthalo green red shade. And the significance of that is the red shade is more neutralized, um, which actually I can show you from an earlier page of my book. Um, I was always taught to use the green shade because it's a brighter color as you can see, but Molly Hashimoto explained, it's funny, it's the same color as this actually, that the phthalo blue red shade is the color of the Northwest, which is definitely true. So, and that's a nice um, Mount Rainier on a nice spring day from a photo I found on uh, Unsplash. Um, okay, so that is probably what this blue is because I haven't switched out my palette yet, but that's okay. We'll just throw that in there and that'll be good. But before I get started, I don't want just one color. You know, in here I can kind of dip in and out of my, my perlene green um, so I can darken it and lighten it, that's great. But what I'd also like to do is take a little, you know, I'm sorry I'm not actually prepared in these videos, but I don't really know what's gonna happen until I sit down to paint. So it's hard to, until I look at it, I don't really know what I'm gonna do. Um, but now that I'm looking at it, I know that I would like to have a separate little cup of yellow. And I'm gonna spray this yellow again. And I don't, let me show you the yellow. I don't really care that there's some dirt on my yellow. Um, here's my warm yellow, so it has some red and some dirt on it. If I'm, if I'm bothered by that, I can go into my warm cup here and get a brush and just kind of clean that out. A sable brush is better because it absorbs better, but you know, I could do it. That's a lot cleaner. Um, now I'll tell you for this one, this is the yellow I'm gonna be using. It's the cool yellow and I don't really care that there's red in it because I'm gonna use that to make green, to lighten the perlene green for the tips of some of these trees that are in the air. Um, the red is just gonna neutralize the color and make it more landscapey, make it more of a neutral, natural color. So I don't mind that that's there and I will just leave that there. But what I would like to do is come in and take some of this and make a little yellow that I can then dip into my green. Now, I'm not gonna need very much, it's a very small painting, um, but I am going to, now sometimes when I'm doing yellow, I, I actually spray straight into here because I don't, um, I just want, I don't, I don't want the, see this, my, my, this is my warm water and it's pretty dirty and brown. I've obviously um, dipped my cool brush in here numerous times. After this, it's probably time to, to clean it out. Um, and if I wanna keep the color kind of precious, then I can just have these little extra cups and just make a little yellow. Now, obviously what I'm gonna do is I'm going to um, dip the yellow into the trees and it's gonna blend anyway, but I wanna start with it fresh because then maybe I can, well, you'll see. Okay, so now let's, 10 minutes of chatting and then hopefully just 10 minutes of painting. So keep my yellow here. Um, the brush that I want to use for this is not in my palette. I recall that I loaned it to Jim in class and I think he may still have it. Last week he had one of my brushes still too. So I'm gonna send him an email. And Jim, if you're watching this, 
Um, I'm expecting that you have one of my brushes that looks kind of like this, but it's black. Um, so instead, I'm gonna use this dagger. This is an Aqua Elite Princeton dagger, which is also really floppy and has this nice point on it. As you can tell uh, from if you've watched these videos for a while, I really like floppy brushes. That keeps me from getting tight. So let's just mix some of this. I can even go closer to the paint here where it will be really dark. All right, that's good. Um, I'm also thinking I might want to drip in a little blue, a little Prussian blue, not the phthalo, uh, this brighter phthalo blue. So I'm going to, I'm going to give that a little spritz. And so I got some of that paint going too. Now I, I need to have all those colors ready because we want to be able to drop them in so that they mingle. And if we, if we mix while we're painting, our paint starts to dry and we lose that ability. So this is a really important tree here. Um, it's important not only for the landscape, but it's coming into the sky. And I'll be honest with you, I'm sort of tempted to put it over here. Um, but I think I'm going to go ahead and do this. Now, that's not great compositionally because that means my viewers budding into this tree. But I, I have some ways I can kind of deal with that. Um, probably it would be better to put it over here, but then I'm a little afraid it's going to get lost in this stuff. And I don't, maybe I could put it up there, but then the point of it is a little too tall. Um, but that's actually compositionally, that's not a bad idea. Then I can have branches coming back in here and kind of pointing my viewer like, Hey, go look at the rest of this stuff. Um, so, you know, maybe here's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to paint it right away. I'm going to paint the ones below it. Um, I'm also going to turn my paper because then I can better see kind of where my edge is here. And so I see a lot of kind of triangle shapes with bumps. And then I'm also noticing how the trees are growing. They're actually growing up a little bit or down now that I've turned it over. So all of those things I need to, I need, so it's okay. So I'm touching down now and I can see that's not dark enough because you can totally, it's just not, it, it, this was darker, and so it's just not activating. Um, it's kind of blending in too much. So let's come over here and get a little more of these colors to mix with my Perlian Green, and we'll see how that works. So I got um, Payne's Blue Gray and uh, Raw Umber. Now there's a lot of trees down here, and this is something that maybe would be better to do to music or, you know, something like that. Um, let me dip in and get a little more darkness going there. Now I do have the brush that I'm thinking, I'm hoping Jim still has because I don't have it here or I can't find it. Um, it's a, I forget what it's called, but it's basically a round that's longer. Is it called a dagger? No, a dagger something else. Um, it's basically a round brush that's longer. And so it will, um, It'll make these, it'll just make some really nice tree marks. So now what I'm doing is I'm just kind of dipping in different colors. In fact, let me get some of this blue and that, because I want some symmetry. I want some consistency in what's happening. And so now I'm going to try to use really just the tip. Um, and then let's turn it and see how it's going. Mm, it's going okay, but to be honest, this color under here, I don't know, it may have been too dark, but I'm not seeing these trees very much, which makes me think I also want to do this one a little taller. And so how do we know these are trees? This would be a, this would be one of, this will be one of my lessons in class is to just paint trees all day. So now that I have that going into the white, I have a much better sense that these are trees. Yeah. So that was a really good call. I didn't need, I don't need all of these to go into the white. I just needed some so that it would read as tree. And now my viewer has a much better sense of what's going on. So I'm going to, I'm going to keep kind of, um, 
I don't know why I'm still holding it upside down. Um, for some reason, it just seems a little easier to me to paint it this way. Oh, there's a dog hair in there, but since on my brush, but since I'm just doing random dots and dashes, and so anywhere there's a light or a white, I'm I'm using that as an opportunity to really accentuate that. Hey, I'm drawing trees. And then maybe I need to fill in, let's get a little more. So here, here, let me get the point going. And so I can really kind of accentuate what I'm seeing. Now, one thing I'm having a problem with in terms of being loose is um, how tight these are up at the top. I'm making mine way too wide. You know, when you have trees at that altitude, they grow very thin. They just don't have a lot of... Um, the energy of lower trees so so that's something that you know I need to I need to pay attention to and then we see these trees all the way across so I'm just going to keep going all the way to that edge and then I can come in and kind of like even use oh I missed over here even use the side of my brush this is an important little spot for information to my viewer and why are those spots important? They're important because of the contrast. Because it's, it's a spot where the viewer is going to see a lot more. And I, I want to also keep, you know, there's still some white behind these trees. So I want to keep some of that too, but I can also cover some of it. And I was talking about something else and I've lost my train of thought, but that's okay. Maybe it'll come back. Maybe it won't. Okay, so I'm just kind of filling that in now while we still have it wet. I'm gonna rinse my brush. First, I'm gonna rinse it in the cool water. And then I'm gonna rinse it in the warm water. And then I'm gonna come in here and get some of this yellow. Dog hair alert. There, I do not want a, a dog hair. Sometimes it's okay, sometimes it's not. Okay, oops, wow, that's really dripping. <laughs> I don't want that much coming off of my brush. And then let's just come in here and kind of go like this. Now do you see that kind of moving in there? Oh, I just love that. I think that's so beautiful. Now I'm just kind of guessing like, which ones would be more in the light? You know, these ones kind of up at the top. And so then I can actually make it a different kind of day. And I think all of that will still read as tree. Now I'm getting a lot of running back into the uh, back into the dark area. And what do I think about that? You know, um, this is the thing about watercolor. Like once you're using good paper and you kind of know what's happening, we don't need to panic because as long as that's wet, I can lift it. I can do whatever I want. But I just want to think about, do I want to lift it? You know, because it's really kind of showing the beauty of what the watercolor does. Maybe what I'd rather do is let it run, you know, just let it go different places. Turn my page and let it kind of move around. And then maybe I decide that's too much of one straight line. And so then I can come in and kind of break that up a little bit and even come back in with more paint and use that as an opportunity to kind of drop need a little more. Now that so you can see my paint's getting streaky. This is the hard part of getting darks with watercolor, which is why I'm liking this perylene green color because it's a dark green and I can make it really thick and I'm not working so hard to mix the right green. So I don't buy very many greens because I think greens are pretty easy to mix in a natural way. Um, uh, unlike, you know, some other things are much harder. Um, like purples, I think are hard to mix a bright, nice purple. But green is generally such a, um, an, well, in the natural environment, it's such a natural color that it, you know, it doesn't matter if you lose some of the vibrancy that actually makes it just look more normal. But to achieve what I just did, I have to, because the it's wet paint and then I'm adding, um, so, oops, dropped my brush. It's wet paint. Um, and then I want to add more paint and then I'm going to get the effect of diluting the paint because there's already water there. It's just nice to have a paint that you can just make really thick. Now this is going to be pasty because this is so wet 
that I'm just going to see. Yeah, because what's happening here is I'm just losing my tree shape entirely. And here too. So I'm having a hard time getting any paint off. So I'm going to wet my brush again and then kind of scrub at it with this little rigger. And what I like about this rigger is it's just like a little pencil. You know, I can just kind of drop in tiny, tiny amounts of paint. Now I'm a little concerned that I'm doing these the wrong direction. I think I was, I think they actually go up. Let's look at my picture again. Yeah, they actually go up. So let's try to fix that. You know, we think of trees like Christmas trees, like how children draw them. And then when you really look at them, you see, oh, that's not what they're doing at all. Oh, see, look what's happening there. I just think that's really beautiful. We have like a nice blue coming through and just, um, I don't know, the watercolor just adds a lot of interest to these trees. So now I'm going to actually take my rigger and just pick up some of this extra paint so that I can... try to add what I hope will look like trees. Um, and this space I think looks kind of weird because obviously that's kind of a, a wall of trees there. But now I can just be a lot more loose because I'm just trying to add some color. You know, I've already explained to my viewer what's going on there. They know that it's trees. And so, it ended up that I did not, um, I didn't really do that tree the way it was. I want this one to be just a little bit varied. So let's drop a little bit more green in there. And maybe this one too. So the tree I wasn't sure what to do with, um, I ended up not including it and that's fine. Because I didn't, you know, the way I had my composition, if I did that tree that much taller than the mountain, it would have come up here. And that would have just kind of blocked my viewer's eye as my viewer's coming in saying, hey, let me check out your painting. It's like, eh, rejection, you know, if I had this big tall shape here. So it would have been better to put it there, but then I just didn't really want to put it there. Um, so anyway, there we have my, my scene of Mount Rainier. Now keep in mind, um, if you haven't watched the first video, so now what I'm doing, I was just, I'm just want a little bit of water on my brush so I can kind of move these things around because I do feel like these trees need a little more randomness, a little more maybe definition or something. So I'm just going to do this while I, while I chat with you. Um, but keep in mind, if you didn't watch the first video that I'm using, uh, rag paper, cotton rag paper. Uh, this is Saunders paper, I think. But Arches is the same. Artistico Fabriano is the same. Um, and then I made it into this little sketchbook. Now this tree has very funky shapes going on, but I really like that. So I'm just gonna leave that the way that it is. I still think it reads as trees and a landscape and being out in the mountains and um, and, you know, it just kind of reminds me of being in those places and, um, which is kind of like my favorite place to be. So I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy with this actually. Yeah. And then how, you know, here we can get a little more like, Ooh, don't overwork it. Um, now I am getting a little bead of water over on this side. I can see as I'm tilting it. I don't know if there you go. Now you can see it too. Now I'm going to, am I going to lift that? Well, if I don't lift it, it's just going to leave a bloom. It might actually look pretty cool. Um, so you know what, because this is, usually I would take my a sable brush and squeeze out the water and lift it. But since this is a sketchbook and I just kind of want to see what happens, I'm just going to leave it. In fact, I'm going to tilt it and accentuate it a little bit and let it dry that way. And then it can show me, it can show me what it does at the end, you know? Uh, but I really like how the tree, oopsie, sorry, too low. I really like how the trees turns out the variety of colors. And you can see that even though um, I added the yellow, 
I kept the yellow really precious and this is why, because I wanted it to do more interesting things than just be a green. I knew that if I added it to the other color when it was wet, then it would move and it would do cool stuff. And, and that's what I wanted to see because a block of, of dark shapes wasn't really going to be that interesting, but now I have a lot more variety and I, my viewer sees that there's light coming through the trees. Now what I have lost a little bit is the rock wall. And to be honest, when you see the thumbnail of this landscape, you may see some ink on it because I'm not gonna do any more with color, with watercolor because it's too small. Um, and I would need kind of some severe lines to get that rock wall back, but I might do that. I might see if I could do that with just a pen uh, now that this is over. So anyway, that's all I'm going to do to this guy with paint. We'll see what happens there with the, with the bloom and if I hate it or love it or, you know, whatever. So there we have it. Thanks, guys.